Slating Channel to the People, episode number 8 82, VTR 422 82. Hello, I'm Fred Noriega. Mention landmarks preservation these days and you're likely to find a controversy, like two recent struggles involving churches and theaters. In the theater's case, the Morosco and the Helen Hayes were demolished in order to make way for the new Portman Hotel, despite the protests of many actors and directors. The hotel was supported by theater owners and producers who claimed the new development will clean up and revitalize the Times Square area. Meanwhile, many churches and synagogues are fighting landmark status. They claim it's a First Amendment violation, infringing on their right to free exercise of religion. I believe that we do need to uh, uh, maintain the architectural and historic and cultural uh, aspects of the life of the city and nation uh, for the sake of the future. Uh, and a landmark Preservation Commission has every right to exist for the purpose of doing that, but we believe that in this particular instance, the Landmarks Commission has uh, uh, enormously overstepped its, uh, its bounds with its designation. I'm Marie Torrey. The controversy that attends landmarks in New York City can be summed up in this way. Show people want landmark status for their theaters, but the clergy does not want churches and synagogues to be designated as landmarks, and somewhere in there are problems for city government officials. Later in this program, players in the landmarks controversy go on the record with their views. Fred? On this edition of Channel 2, the people will examine the effects of landmarking on theaters and churches. Suddenly someone said they're going to go for it. And you turned around and now there was no joking. Now it was like, it was upon you. And to see that come across that lot and uh, with a lot of clacking, almost like a dramatic, it was like, uh, ho, ho, ho. We win. And when it hit her, she was tough. I would consider myself to be a, a preservationist. Um, uh, I believe that we do need to uh, uh, maintain the architectural and historic and cultural uh, aspects of the life of the city and nation uh, for the sake of the future. Uh, and a landmark. Preservation Commission has every right to exist for the purpose of doing that, but we believe that in this particular instance, the Landmarks Commission has uh, uh, enormously overstepped its, uh, its bounds with its designation. These are the latest battles of the buildings, and like most landmark preservation struggles, the issues are about more than bricks and mortar. I am so proud of this city! Don't let him come from out of town again and do it. Colleen Dewhurst was one of the star-studded cast fiercely fighting to save the theaters. The Morosco was the scene of her one-hit play, but she says it's more than mere sentimentality that sent her into battle. Historically, in every way, you cannot ever, ever replace those two theaters. So it became like a sentimental thing, they thought, on our part. It was kind of cute us standing out there in the rain and the hail, singing and asking and speaking and so on. But what had to be understood was that this was symptomatic of a disease that is through the whole country. But nobody listens because it's about money and progress. The Morosco is about something much different, she says. 
you weren't reaching out. You could feel that house. It was like a breathing, living entity out there. You cannot replace that kind of an emotional impact that people have from that kind of intimacy with you. Because you're living for them. You are. That's really what you're doing up there. Dewhurst was one of 200 people arrested for trying to block the wrecking ball. You would think that actor Louis Statlin would have joined her. But like Groucho Marx, the man he portrays on stages across the country, he did things differently. He was a Portman supporter. I do not delude myself in thinking that the new theater that is going to be put into the Portman is in any way going to compare to the Morosco. But to bring that type of commerce into the, into the area, the people who feel that Mr. Portman has a lot of political clout, which he does, and there's been an element of collusion. If they give him that much credit, they have to give him enough credit to think that he has the muscle to clean up the immediate area. And Statlin has a personal stake in the area. His office is right in the heart of Times Square. To go out and, and be as effective as the people were who protested the theater, and it was very emotional, and they were totally sincere. Uh, I think that they were trying to corner the market on, on being virtuous, but I live and work in this area. Um, I know that women can't walk by my office without being uh, hooted at. And the social ills of this country are such that an element of people who can't go away, they can't go to Cape Cod, they can't go to the country, they have to congregate in the theater area, and uh, it is not healthy. He's seen similar preservation protests where, in the end, the builders were right. It was great protest because the Hyatt was built in an area in which Daniel Boone's house was or something. Uh, but it has brought so much commerce into Lexington, Kentucky. And what has happened is they've torn down slums and revitalized old air, this old area in which now people can live there. The church is in the process of of fighting the landmark battle. We have taken the city of New York to court. Reverend Skip George heads the Church of St. Paul and St. Andrew. The church is active in the Upper West Side through programs like free meals for senior citizens and an Alcoholics Anonymous Center. But George and his congregation do not see eye to eye with the community on the recent landmarking of his church. We believe that the church ought to exercise ministry rather than to uh, maintain bricks and mortar. Uh, we think it would be in the best interests of the church and of our service to the community to raise the church, to, to tear it down. It has served a, a useful purpose now for almost 90 years. Uh, it was built to the glory of God, yes indeed. Uh, and for that period of time it has uh, uh, done an absolutely magnificent job of ministering in the city. But. Uh, new occasions call for uh, new duties. And those new duties, he says, call for bolstering a dwindling budget in congregation. We could establish uh, on this site a sufficient space for use by the church and develop uh, an income generating asset as well at this site, which would enable the church to carry on its ministry and to in fact uh, establish uh, a much more productive uh, ministry on the west side of Manhattan than we now have. Does the church wish to build a commercial 16-story building in order to generate funds for its ministry? For its ministry, yes, indeed. Those are your plans? We have absolutely no, um, <clears throat> we have no deal, no contractual arrangement, anything like that. But you've gone through the mechanics of developing that, yes. that mm -hmm. proposal? Yes. But there can be no development as long as the church has landmark status. So the church is fighting that status with a lawsuit. It claims, among other things, violation of the First Amendment. The um, founding fathers of this country established the notion that there will be no established church in America, first. And second, that the state shall not interfere with the free exercise of religion. The Court of Appeals of the State of New York specifically held in a decision in December 1980 that the Landmarks Law, as applied to religious property, was a constitutional. Ralph Menapace heads the Municipal Art Society, the oldest preservation group in the city. He also invokes the First Amendment. 
if you give them some sort of special preference or treatment that's not available to other people engaged in the same commercial activity, you do raise a question of whether you are supporting religion in a manner which is offensive to the First Amendment. Reverend George says the church can't afford the $400,000 renovation required by the Landmark Commission. But Menape says the commission offers a recourse. If you have a hardship, you can come in and avail yourself of our processes which permit relief for hardship. Uh, they have elected not to try to use those relief provisions for reasons which I don't quite understand. In fact, Menape thinks the church would get what it wants under this provision. If their case is as, is as bad as they say it is, it should be very easy to prove. The landmark law must weigh the interest of more than one building and congregation, says Menapace. The very idea of landmarks preservation is, is that there is a public interest in the preservation of these buildings. The public interest is exactly what was served when the theaters were torn down, says Statlin. I think long, be, long uh, after the Morosco Theater and the Bijou Theater and the Helen Hayes is forgotten, um, the Portman Hotel cannot help but bring in uh, a cleaner, uh, more productive element to the theater district. You are not talking about progress. You are talking about a deadening of the human being. You are talking about taking the humanity out of and destroying and going for something that you think is progress. Sterility is cleanliness. Sterility is not cleanliness. Attacks continue to fly back and forth. Some say the city should tighten the reins of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Others say that the commission isn't landmarking enough. But consider these three buildings. Radio City Music Hall, Rockefeller Center, the Waldorf Astoria. None of these has landmark status. Neither did the Morasco. This report will continue with Marie Tory in just a moment. The disturbing thing about the death of the Morasco and Helen Hayes theaters is that they were destroyed in spite of the fact that people everywhere wanted the theaters to live on. And in the future, this isn't going to happen again. Otherwise, we're going to be left with no soul and no, no, no culture in this country. Actors cried and protested. I think by taking down those two theaters and uh, in effect ruining one of the best streets, two of the best streets in, the, in, in that uh, district, it's, it was counterproductive. A ranking showman objects the Helen Hayes Theater was, was sufficiently worthy on architectural grounds to have been rescued. The head of Landmarks Preservation expresses sorrow, and a theater magnet laments. It was an unfortunate sacrifice. It really never should have come to it, but it did come to it. Many questions arise about those violated theaters. If so many wanted them around, why were they destroyed? A public reacting too late? An unbending bureaucracy? Or did a consortium of political and real estate interests take matters into their own hands and put profit above cultural heritage? From the following dialogue, conclusions may be drawn. What's behind it? Heard above the din is the voice of Joe Papp, who guides the destinies of the New York Shakespeare Festival. When the Morasco and the Helen Hayes were about to be hit by the wrecking ball to make way for the proposed Portman Hotel, a $300 million project accommodating 2,000 rooms and a 1,500-seat theater, Papp organized artists to block the demolition. He lost the battle, but he's hanging in there to guard against a similar fate for other theaters. I think people can have an influence in a democracy if they function, if they, if they come out and do something. You don't write a letter. You don't uh, pick up a telephone, although that helps from time to time. You become very vocal. You begin to exercise your democratic rights, and you even submit to the indignity of being arrested to, to prevent what we call incursion by real estate developers on, on what we call a historic area. I was sorry that a lot of the people who turned out, who signed petitions, who were active, were not active 10, 12 years ago when this area started its great decline. Gerald Schoenfeld, chairman of the Schubert organization, which owns 17 theaters. Had there been that kind of activity early on, then perhaps we never would have come to the uh, point 
that we would have had to sacrifice two theaters in order to really, in my opinion, stabilize this area. I appeared and I did as, as much as I could. I, I testified against it. So forth. there was no organization. Uh, there, was no, there was no group of people that really came out in, a, in, a, in an effective way against it. This organization developed as a result of the fight to preserve it. In other words, among performing members of the Broadway community, there was no measurable concern for the festering elements in their habitat. It was only when the theaters were physically threatened that demonstrations took place. Joe Papp also was critical of the Landmarks Preservation Commission for not saving the theaters by granting them landmark status. Commission Chairman Kent Barwick explains that the city administration opted for area improvement over two more landmarks in a polluted environment. In the Lindsay administration, the city invited Mr. Portman to build the Portman Hotel on the site of those two theaters. I'm not myself a, a great admirer of the architecture of the Portman Hotel, but rightly or wrongly, three successive administrations have thought that the key to the rejuvenation of the theater district was bringing in the Portman Hotel. As for Joe Papp's criticism of the commission for not giving the theaters in question landmark status, He's right to the extent that the Landmarks Commission has never completed a comprehensive survey of the city. If the Landmarks Commission had had the resources to do what should have been done 10 or 15 years ago, a comprehensive survey of the city, that the, a different kind of decision could have been made a decade ago. I mean, I think the Portman Hotel uh, could have come in across the street, for instance, there was another site. But what you're saying then is that the Landmarks Preservation Commission today was powerless to save the Helen Hayes and the Morosco. Is that what you're saying? The way our law works is that our designations have to be ratified by the Board of Estimate. And what the Board of Estimate does when they consider one of our designations is they say, is this in conflict with an already adopted public plan or public policy since they had already voted uh, to demolish the theaters, in effect, uh, the determination had been made. If the public had perceived that this area of New York was actually being threatened and driven out of existence, then, I think, we would not have been subject to extinction by the impact of concentrated pornography. And we were able, we were able to stem that decline. And what we were really doing by stemming that decline was trying to create a climate in this area conducive to f economic redevelopment. And I think that we have now succeeded. Uh, I know what, what pornography is. There wasn't a single pornographic house on 45th Street or, or a massage parlor. And they began to tear down buildings. And the Piccadilly is going to come down. But the way, the way they really want to clean it up is sanitize it. By putting this big hotel in the middle of that district, they think they're going to cut out, cut out pornography. Nobody is looking to make this an antiseptic, sanitized place. And uh, the idea of, uh, of, you know, the sort of willy-nilly uh, criticism uh, always, uh, always bothers me. Uh, anything to excess, in my judgment, is wrong. Uh, what exists now on 42nd Street is an excess which has threatened the very existence of the theaters. Joe Papp and his volunteer committee to preserve the historic theater district now understand the need for constant vigil. When the city's board of estimate held a hearing on a new Midtown zoning proposal which reportedly would safeguard 44 Broadway theaters, Papp and some members of his committee turned up at the hearing. My name is Tammy Grimes. Since the Morosco and the Helen Hayes Theater were torn down, thousands and thousands and thousands of people, not only in New York City, but all over the country, have cared very much that this cannot happen again. Uh, my name is Joseph Papp. We submit the following. First, the unique and extraordinary aggregate of theaters in the Midtown Broadway area be designated an historical district. I believe when Joe Papp and the others who are concerned with the future of the theater study the zoning that they will feel as I do that the zoning goes a long, long way towards removing some of the traditional tension between the need to conserve something and creating a lot of economic incentive to change it. So-called economic incentive also is creating problems for the Landmarks Commission from another sector, the religious community. 
A study released by a group of New York religious leaders says hundreds of churches and synagogues are financially burdened by the obligation to preserve old buildings that were designated as landmarks. There are assumptions, uh, apparently, in, in the report that it costs more money if you're designated as a landmark, but there's no, there are no examples given of that. Uh, we went back over our, the actual permits that we've written for the last 17 years to find out in how many cases we actually had forced somebody to do something that they didn't want to do. We couldn't find any. What particularly rubs the New York clergy is inability to earn a profit from their properties, as is the case with the controversial St. Bartholomew's on Park Avenue, which has been offered $100 million for letting a commercial building go up on its premises. First Amendment violations are claimed by the clergy in such cases. This issue has been litigated. Uh, the Ethical Culture Society uh, undertook a suit a few years ago when it was designated as a landmark and said that it was a violation of the First Amendment. And the highest court in New York State determined that it was not. Back to the theater situation, Joe Papp continues his critical stride, finding fault with the Portman Hotel Theater that will take the place of the Morasco and Helen Hayes. The theater they have there now, or at least proposing to have now, is, a, is an impossible theater. They can't build it, there's not enough height. The dressing rooms are on the stage uh, left side. They're a mile away from the stage, incidentally. And the actors will have to go through the, the public corridors to get to the stage. And they'll probably, you know, bang into some drunken conventioneer and uh, miss their cues. That conventioneers would interfere with people running into the, uh, onto the stage, uh, to me, is absurd on the face of it. I mean, one of the funny things about New York is you have to lose something to determine, uh, to get busy to save the things that are left. And, uh, of course, the Landmarks Law drew, grew directly out of the loss of Pennsylvania Station. Pennsylvania Station was, I think, a more important piece of architecture than Grand Central, but its loss made it possible to save Grand Central. And uh, let's hope that out of the loss of the two theaters uh, comes sufficient appreciation for the ones that are left to preserve those that deserve it.